We're all grooving, baby. <laughs> Hello, hello. We're all grooving to the beat of the music that we were just hearing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today for the first 2021 Conshell Productions Artist Chat. And um, let me tell you a bit about me. My name is Magalie Colleman Christopher. I'm the Artistic Director of Conshell Productions. And at Conshell Productions, if you've never met us before, our focus is to showcase, produce, present, new work by Caribbean American and Caribbean diaspora artists. And today our chat is gonna be so off the chain, you're gonna be like so thrilled about it. But before we get to the chat, I wanna give you a little clue. If you want to enable the closed captioning for this event, go ahead, this is, go to the lower right section of your window in Facebook and you'll see this little wheel thing. Click on that and it'll take you to the settings button and then you can switch on your closed captioning. If you didn't know it, I didn't know it, but I discovered it because closed captioning is so essential, especially if you want to be able to watch without listening or if listening is a bit challenging for you. And one more thing before we start, write in your comments and your questions. This is a conversation between us artists, but we're, we want to include you. We, only, we can only include you if you put in a little question in there. So send in your questions and we will address them in the course of it. So now, allow me to introduce you to the guests of our chat, Ron O.J. Parson. Ron O.J. Parson hails from Buffalo, New York. Remember the Bills? The Bills? The Bills? They did so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buffalo, New York. And he is a graduate of the, prof of the professional theater program at the University of Michigan. He is the former co-founder and artistic director of Onyx Theater in Chicago and is currently resident artist and at Chicago's Court Theater. Ron has worked as both actor and director in film and television and theater and has directed a, a variety of plays at various theaters throughout Chicago and regionally. OJ has directed over 30 productions of August Wilson's plays and he's also directed a world premiere of Palmer Park at the Stratford Shakespeare Festival. In Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Ron. Good to be here. You should let people know you were a founding member of Onyx Theater in Chicago. I was a founding member of Onyx Theater in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Fenezia Farrell. Fenezia is a Haitian American playwright who is currently focusing on the divine metaphysical dilemma of Black and Latinx girlhood. Did you hear that? I'm going to underline that. The divine metaphysical dilemma of Black and Latinx girlhood. That's how deep this woman is. That's deep, Go yeah. the rest of her bio. Love it. Generally, her plays span revolutions, islands, and Afrofuturism. She works as a teaching artist for Vibe Theater Experience. In terms of development, she's developed a number of pieces with Conchal Productions. But she is currently, yeah, 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 an artist in residence at New York Stage and Film and was a 2020 National Young Playwright Residency recipient for the Echo Theater Company in Los Angeles and is a proud member of the Dramatist Guild of America. Proud is good. I like proud. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Next, I'd like to introduce you to L. Trey Wilson. L. Trey Wilson is an actor, director, writer, producer, and facilitator living in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm in New York. He's in LA. We're going to have snow. He doesn't have snow. Yes. Originally, <laughs> yes, yeah, he's nodding. Yes, yes, yes. Originally from Chicago, Illinois, Trey has worked on, in all areas. He's an award-winning playwright, having received the NAACP Award the LA Weekly Award, the GLAAD Award, the, ba the Backstage West Garland Award, and the LA Ovation Award. He's got awards, you hear? He's, he's, he's got awards. And he's also a facilitator of conversations regarding race, gender, culture, and sexuality 
and he's facilitated these workshops throughout the world in Canada, Israel, the United States. And I'm really excited to have him as part of this conversation because our topic today, as you know, is equity, diversity, and inclusion from the viewpoint of artists of African descent, BIPOC artists. So I'm gonna start out this conversation, everybody. I'm gonna hit you really hard, all right? With the question of questions. What is the first thought that comes to your mind when you hear the words equity, diversity, and inclusion? Read that in. Whoever wants to answer, go for it. Let somebody <laughs> jump in there. Come on now. I was muted. I said money. 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 Let's go to money. Expound upon that. I think about money in many contexts. Now that I'm working in the you know nonprofit space, I've noticed that. Diversity, equity, inclusion. We just we need to be paid, y'all. Money makes the world go round. We need to watch watch where the money goes, and that is going to show us where the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion are. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you have a diverse program. Maybe you have a couple artists of color that you put in your newsletter that you send out. But are those the artists that are getting the main stage productions? Are those the artists that are getting paid in the same way as everybody else? We all know about wage gap and all of that mm. mess. How are black theater companies, how are different theaters being paid? Like, are they getting the grants? Are they getting the money? Or are, you know, theater companies that only typically put white artists on the main stage writing for grant funding to put their development program for artists of color? Where, where's the money? The money, yeah. the money yeah. is, the, is, is important to me because yeah, we deserve to be paid. That's actually, yeah, that's good. I, I was thinking of another word, but I'm a coattail on that. Um, you know, back in the day, again, I'm, I've been around doing, I've been doing theater since uh, 1967. So uh, it's a long time, but uh, over the years, uh, the money thing, because a lot of these grants would go to, quote unquote, white theaters mm -hmm. to develop black audience. And then no money was going to the black theater that needed audience, period. You know, so so I agree with you that I hear you on that. But I also would like to say talent, because without the equity and diversity, a lot of talent is being, you know, not used because people can't get into or work. And a lot of times it's about when we can't do that, we do our own. And that's that that's part of the thing that I feel about, you know, this new movement. Of course, we want the theaters to recognize and the white theaters and all that, but we want our own. We tell our we tell our stories better than they can tell them. So why do we, you know, I'd rather have a theater like your theater, Magali, that's doing those plays that can do them the proper way. Why, why want to go to do, do it there when we can do it in our own? But of course, grant money and whatnot, you know, we need, we need the money. That's what I'm saying. But also it opens it up for the talent that is out there that doesn't get an opportunity to perform, you know? So, yeah, so both of those things, I guess, are very important with this new equity, diversity, inclusion, you know, mm -hmm. words, you know, but the bottom line is doing the real thing right, properly. Yeah. Okay, exactly. I agree. Now, Trey, Trey. Well, a few words came to mind, but the one that I'll talk about today is time. Uh, and in terms of it's time, it's yeah. time for diversity and inclusion to be a main part of all of our conversations and all of our practices. And I think the other thing that has time resonate for me is because what happened over 2020 has me feel personally, and I think in terms of my community and most marginalized communities, that now it's time for us to speak our voices in a more direct, clear, and um, loud way to express where we are, who we are, and what we're capable of, and what we require as part of the human race. So time comes to mind uh, regarding the question of diversity and inclusion. I think it's time. I think it the more we accept that, the more we respond to that, the more we relate to that, then it 
benefits the whole. And I think that's the missing piece, the recognition yeah. that we all get benefited. Yeah. It's uh, about time, think, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's about time. time. <laughs> no, that's great. You got three good good words out of that question. That was great. <laughs> and I really, I totally agree with you all. But I think when we think also about where's the money, we need to think in terms of it's time for there to be an endowment that we put together ourselves. Yeah, oh. agree. Yep. Time to okay. pay the talent. <laughs> you know, so stop turning to think in terms of we're we're billionaires. We are. Our community, our international community, there's so much money in it. Totally agree. You know, that's yeah. the time and the money. That's a great combo. And then yeah. but but thinking in terms of present tense into the future tense, right? How did the pandemic and the peaking awareness of peaking for some, long existing, but peaking for some, awareness of racial inequality, inequity. How did it alter and influence your, your sense of your purpose as an artist in 2020 and your, your sense of a, your, who you are as an artist in the future? Did, did, was there a shift for you at all? And what That's interesting. Can I, can I respond? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Go, jump up in there. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time. And I've been in a lot of theaters where I was the only black director coming in. And so, but that was always in my head. It's like, where are black people at? Where, where, where are the stories? What, you know? And I, I give that example of, you know, when I went to Steppenwolf years ago and you know, Steppenwolf had this history of, of, of being Lily White, you know, mm -hmm. granted, now it's very diverse, very multicultural. I mean, that's the whole thing. But they, you know, we, I've been, and, and Trey's probably been there too. We've been thinking that way forever. Every time we do something, it's like, you know, it's about inclusion. It's about diversity. So it's, it's beautiful for me to see this. You know, I, I used to always say, uh, in fact, when I got here to Chicago, where I'm in Chicago now, and people would say, oh, you don't need to go over there. You don't need, they ain't doing nothing for black people. They ain't doing nothing. Well, that's why you go. You go over there and mix it up. And uh, and, I, and I have to say, look at Steppenwolf now, because finally they realize, hey, we need to include some of these talented people we got in this city, you know? And, it, and it's happening. But that's the type of thing that can carry over to a lot of theaters. And, and, and it's happening now, you know, I'm at Court Theater now, I've been there 15 years, and they still, they had that kind of uh, reputation as well. There were people in Hyde Park, which is predominantly black community, that didn't even know the theater existed. So they know now, and things are <laughs> happening. So, you know, it's, whatever your question was, I got off on a tangent, but you know, that's what I'm saying is like, yes, you know, it feels good that, oh, 2020, yeah. It feels good that this is happening because it's opening up things for, you know, other opportunities for young black directors, Latin directors, you know, Haitian directors. Everybody can get in the mix and we can see the beautiful talent that's coming out, you know, with the writing and with the producing, you know, because there's so much here. You know, it's in, it's in everything else, sports and everything else. You know, football is dominated. You know, hockey now has got a high, high content. Baseball, of course, it should be in theater that way as well because there's a lot of talented people out here. And You've already been an amazing, an amazing proponent for the artists of color. You've been out yeah. there, out there. So how do you feel that your purpose has changed or is it, or is it more empowered? because of this like peaked awareness of racial well, I think it's being recognized. Okay. People are recognizing the, the talent that, that's there. They, they recognize the, 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 the uh, discrimination that has happened, systemic. Mm -hmm. I know some people, I read, you know, some people, you know, even black people are like, well, there's no systemic racism. I've, been, <laughs> I've, I've seen, you know, there's, black, there's a black president. There was a black president. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. still, it's systemic. That's the whole point. That people, we, we don't have the opportunities that everybody else has always had. So those opportunities are coming. I don't want to dominate. I, mean, I need to let, you know, the young people talk. <laughs> I'm, talking I'm, about sure. I'm talking about finesse. Uh, yeah, I know uh, you're talking about me because you were looking at me. I could tell. 
Why do you want Trey to think I was talking about him being a young people? You know, he, he, <laughs> wow. Oh, you guys wow. threw down the gauntlet. See how we like, treat oh. each other. You know, see how we do each other. Boom! boom. <laughs> I hear you. You Go look young. Girl. Yeah. Well, He's I was young. just going to say that, you know, listening to you speak, I think that we have, like, people my age and my generation, you know, I'm, I'm a rising artist. I think we have to thank the, you know, Ron OJ, but really OG. <laughs> um, like, you know. <laughs> Sorry, it. not having to You're an OG, and we have to thank you because so many people in your generation and before sacrificed for people in my generation to be able to have the opportunities. Like, you know, so many of my, you know, I'm friends, one of my actor friends, he's been able to have, you know, a pretty great career so far. And he's like, yeah, I don't really feel limited. And I, we were talking about it and I was like, well, we don't feel limited because other people were. <laughs> um, and I think about, you know, yeah, the question. Yeah, like, you know, we have to thank you because at the end of the day, I sometimes think to myself now when, when people like say, oh, what are you writing about in light of all these things happening? I've never felt more free as an artist because I know that there are so many amazing black artists that I don't, I don't feel an obligation to write about anything in particular. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can follow what I really want because even if I don't think that, you know, when before I, I grew up in Miami and Terrell was really the only I'm so happy you mentioned him because he was really the only writer I knew from my town. But so when I just Terrell, for those oh. who don't know, the audience. Yeah, I'm sorry, Terrell mm -hmm. Alvin McCraney. Um, he's an incredible playwright. He wrote um the let me pull it off my. Everybody bookshelf. knows about Moonlight, so you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah the brother sister plays. But Moonlight came out like when I was a senior in high school, and I always felt that you know, it wasn't until I moved to New York and I started encountering all of these incredible creatives that I realized like if you're thinking about something there's probably someone who's created it or ha is creating it right now and I don't mean that to say there's nothing new but the scarcity mindset of oh nobody's telling stories about me nobody no there are so many people telling stories about us like when I met Magali that opened doors and she's always putting me on to Haitian creatives like there's so many different things that I just I just feel free honestly because not because of anything that's changed on the other end of the of the conversation but because I've been able to see what we have done because even if we haven't had as much opportunity we still have created right when we look at the OGs like OJ you hear the bio and you're like oh my god that's amazing even if you were being looked at in a different way from the people with maybe less talent, maybe more money, and <laughs> child, let me not get petty. Well, but, you know, it makes me think thing. about, it makes me think about like Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, who just passed away. I mean, can you imagine what they went through? And here's a writer that I would like you to, I mean, you might know about her, Finesse, uh, Pauline Hopkins. She was a writer at the turn of the century before the Howard Renaissance that wrote about sci-fi, uh, metaphysical information, and this is a black woman. Her and Alice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Everybody can look that up. Yeah, Pauline, Pauline Hopkins of One Blood was a book. We're doing a we're doing an excerpt from her book uh, at court. Oh, oh, oh. Alice Moore Dunbar uh, uh, Nelson, another writer from the turn of the century, and and they're writing these things. Black women writing about these issues, you know, uh, gender and race. In the turn of the century, 1902, 1903, 90, you know, so those are people we need to know about that now that these theaters are recognizing these different things about us as a culture, we can find and bring these things to light that we weren't just slaves, we weren't just maids, we weren't just butlers and all of that. We were writers, creators, yep. sculptors, Meta, Meta Warren Fuller, a famous sculptor, who wrote in a, a statue of Mary Turner, that a lot of people didn't know about. Those are things that need to be known. And now that these, these theaters are recognizing, we need to find out and tell those stories, right, Trey? Absolutely. And I was gonna say that earlier when you were talking um, that even before Ron, believe me, there was a, actually a time before Ron. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our, our artists have always been in existence. 
and doing things throughout the time when there was many more struggles than we're facing today. Yeah. But but to speak to Magalie's question in terms of how I'm experiencing it, it um, I feel a greater sense of responsibility. Uh, I feel a greater sense of responsibility to carry on that tradition, uh, to be the representative of this point in time from the way I'm seeing it, um, how I'm experiencing it. And I feel like that's my responsibility now to carry on that tradition that has happened throughout our time uh, so that the next generations and the next generations and the next centuries can have our version yeah. of history, which I think is something that we haven't had in the past. We haven't had our version of history represented to us. I know I wasn't taught it. Um, the American history I was taught didn't include much about people that looked like me. Right. So that's what I feel now. I feel a very strong sense of responsibility uh, to share my voice at this point in time um, with those that are existing at this point in time to have a conversation about how our lives are experiencing, how we are experiencing our lives. Thank you. It's really interesting. It's like, I know you're all inspired by the insanity that we've been living in in the past four years. And it comes in the work. And sometimes as a writer, I find it coming into my work and I wonder, am I limiting myself to just seeing the world through the here and now, as opposed to focusing on here and now and how we could be in the future, but it's here and now. And it's potent and it's, and, and, and it's instilled with organic drama. <laughs> how can we help but write to the times and create to the times? Um, and in, in, in terms of the times, I love the fact that you mentioned two writers, Ron. Are there any writers that you, Trey, you, Vanessa, are reading right now and you're thinking, wow, thinking about the future, thinking about now, thinking about the future, thinking about now, this book is really motivating me and, and fueling my creative juices and blah, blah, blah. I wanna share it with the world so that they could be fueled as well. Well. Um, Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, I think is just spectacular. Um, I think that the way he communicates his thoughts and the logic and history and present day and how we're experiencing life and how we experience racism and anti-racism and what that practice looks like, uh, I just think is profound. I had to, I, have, I can only read like, a, I've only read a chapter a day because it was so full and so dense and, and resonates so powerfully that I recommend how to be an anti-racist. Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been looking at uh, uh, Angela Davis, some of her uh, writings, you know, because again, the, like as those two writers I mentioned from uh, turn of the century, uh, it's making me want to read uh, or more about people who are, who are influenced by them, you know, being, you know, 18, 1800s. I mean, you know, Alice Moore Dunbar, I think she died in 1930 or 1915 or something like that. So all the stuff that she was doing, uh, you know, she had a, a, a publication, I think it was called the uh, American, oh, I can't remember now, my mind is, is blown. But once you look it up and you look up Alice uh, Moore Dunbar Nelson, it'll come up all her all her stuff, but she had a publication. I mean, she was writing about black issues at, at, the, at a time way before the civil rights movement, you know? So, uh, but Angela Davis has always intrigued me. I, I wrote a poem called The Pinnacle of Freedom because I went to see her one time and she used that phrase and it, it just inspired a whole bunch of stuff. I was working on a play and I went to see her and I was like, you know, that, you know, you get inspired like that, you know? And I don't write a lot. I used to write a lot of poetry. But, uh, you know, now I read I read more plays than books, to be honest, but, uh, you know, and still write a little poetry every now and then. But there's so many people that influenced us in every facet that a lot of people don't even know about. That's why back to the inclusion thing, these stories can be told now and we can yeah. and we can hear about these people that we we didn't even know about. So it's, it's, it's really like I said, you know. And I was just influenced last night or night before last when I saw uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, um, which is a phenomenal movie that is about Fred Hampton, Chicago. And that was fantastic. So where did I you think, see that? Where did you see it? Where is it? It's on HBO Max. HBO Max. Okay. 
Um, I, I was inspired once again re referencing Ron a bit. Um, Chicago. It's Chicago, Fred Hampton, absolutely. But then um, I also love watching Viola Davis and oh. Chadwick. I mean, they're phenomenal. Um, so in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So I think there's so many ways to be influenced uh, by what's happening now with our contemporaries. You know, at, at first, you know, it's funny because, you know, they're making the movie and this and that. And at first, though, the, the theater purists are like, well, what, how are they going to do that movie? Whatever, you know. But, you know, the fact that it got out and it made people aware of August Wilson, you know, it's making people you know, read about more of his plays. It always amazes me because I've done a lot of August, no, no doubt. But I was at the, I got my vaccine, my vac vaccine today. You did? And, uh, last night, actually. And I was at, in the hospital, University of Chicago Hospital. And I, and I was, you know, I was passing out cars, court theater right on campus. Has anybody heard of the theater? No, can't, the theater right there on campus. And then I said, well, anybody heard about August Wilson? No, I didn't. They, they, and these are young black women, you know, and didn't know who August Wilson was. So it always amazed me, but then I told them I passed out some, some information. I say, hey, when the theater gets back, you got to come check us out because we're going to be doing two trains running, you know. So that that amazes me. So I think the movie that you brought, in fact, you brought that up with Viola. A lot of people love Viola and they're going to see that and they're going to say, wow, I wonder if this guy has written anything else. And I know some people tell me, they say, aren't you tired of doing August Wilson? You know? And I say, well, do people get tired of doing uh, Eugene O'Neill or, or Tennessee no. Williams or Shakespeare? No. You do great work. You know, how many times has Streetcar Named Desire been done? <laughs> or Long Day's Journey in Tonight? People don't say, oh, wow, another Tennessee Williams play. I mean, you know, it's, you know, so, you no, know, you don't. But I'm just saying, like, you know, that movie hopefully will open up a lot of people's eyes to great writing and make them read other things and you know and learn about our culture that way. Because a lot of the young people don't we don't we didn't like you said, Trey, we didn't learn a lot about our history in a school, you know, and now they are. That's the thing about the movement has made some people wanna talk about our culture. And I think that's that's a good thing that's come out of the movement, you know, hopefully even more. How about you, Venezia? Any book that you are reading that you want to share? Um, <laughs> I'm I'm like, I'm still reeling because I I love August Wilson, but I also love Tennessee Williams. So I felt seen by that comment. I was like, yeah, but obviously, like, I think that August deserves as much space as a Tennessee. And so I, I definitely agree with that. Um, lately, I re I'm pulling from my bookshelf. Um, I've been reading this book called How We Show Up by Mia Birdsong. She's an activist Black woman in Oakland, and it's about how we can reclaim family, friendship, and community, and it's rooted in how the American dream doesn't necessarily make space um, for real connection and how mm -hmm. she would meet people who are you know, some of the wealthiest people in her town and they were, you know, starved for real intimacy and how we can look at queer family and communities of color and alternative ways, like how those communities have found ways to make real connection and family and what we can learn from, um, as Elche said, like as a human race. Um, and then the second thing that comes to mind is a book called Patsy. Um, I love this book so much. It, everyone should read it. It came out last year. Um, it's by Nicole Dennis Ben, who is a Jamaican lesbian who lives in Brooklyn. And the book is about um, a woman who, she's about 25 when the book begins, and she leaves her daughter in Jamaica to go pursue the woman in America that she's always loved. And it is such an incredible, it's such an incredible book. Um, I love it so much. And um yeah, there's so, but I agree with everyone that there's there's inspiration everywhere. Um, I also have been pulling from Zora Neale Hurston a lot lately, um, in terms of like being rooted. But I feel like there's so much. I feel like I'm always going to be inspired because every day there's someone new I'm learning about, and I'm like, there's only so much, so many hours in a day that I can read. <laughs> I'm like. There's so many books out there, you know? Yeah. It's like, you, you, there's not enough hours in the day to read all of them. I've got like four books piled up and I'm reading them alternately because yep. 
There's only so many hours in a day. Yep. So what are you guys working on right now? I mean, you're all busy. What are you doing right now? What's keeping you busy? So uh, I'm uh, writing a pilot, television pilot. Um, and I wrote I a expect to get a phone call. <laughs> you all should get phone calls. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm working on that. I also wrote a play recently that I want to have as a companion piece for another play. I have a play called Three Part Disharmony, which is about three black men being stopped by the police and how they all have different reactions to. Um, but there's another piece I wrote, which is called Word in Question. And that's a play about African-Americans having a conversation about the use of the N-word, word, word in question. So both these plays are plays that one's about 20 minutes long, the other's about 30 minutes long. But I want them to have a play, a conversation, an intermission, a play, and a conversation. Because wow. I think so much of these plays need to have conversations. Um, I wrote those plays in particular to stimulate a discussion around these issues because there's no right answer how men of color should deal when they're interacting with police. There's no right answer of how to use the N-word, when to use it, who should use it, where it can be used, in what context. So I wanted to have a conversation which we can have a collective discussion around this. And it's with people of color. So it's about what are we thinking about it? What are we talking about it? What are our perspectives on it? And not just about how other people are perceiving it and their perspectives on it. Mm -hmm. So those two things. And then just for the audience to know, um, my play, Three Part Disharmony, is being done in Canada starting next, starting tomorrow night. It's being streamed okay. online, and the link will be on the chat. So if you want to take a look, um, is so there a ticket price? Is it free? Tell us about the. You know what? The uh, it's a theater in Canada. I think there may be a small ticket price. I'm not sure. Um, so I can't, but the link would probably give all the information if you get a chance to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Thank I don't. You. I don't see it in the chat. Is it? Did you put it in there already? It's in the Facebook chat. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We didn't, we didn't. So if you can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. We're we're gonna send it to you via email, so you can have access to well, it. What I was gonna say too, as well, is uh, I was involved in a theater in Buffalo when I was, you know, back living back there, uh, uh, called the Ujima Company, and uh, my friend uh, Lorna C. Hill who founded the company and, and we worked on it, I worked with them together, had passed away recently. And the theater is trying to stay afloat. So they're looking, they're doing a, a, a small one act play festival. And I'd like all three of you to send, uh, you know, works that you might think that they might be, uh, you know, if you have some one acts, definitely send, I'll give you the address after, we finish this and um, uh, and if anybody else on Facebook or whatever, but I think it'd be perfect opportunity for some of you to get plays done because they are really eager and you know they're they're they they've been around a long time, but uh, it's just something that I think from just hearing these plays and Magley, of course, I know a lot of your plays. And I think that this would be an opportunity to get some some so what's so, the, give some inclusion the some uh, so some inclusion in some, say it again spell the name of the organization so it's we can Ujima, type it into the chat U U J I M A company Buffalo New York dot org or dot com dot I believe it's dot org I'm not okay. sure but if you just put Ujima it, it'll come up and Google it and then everything will come up. But uh, they're looking for it. They're trying to. They're trying to keep it going. She 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 ran it for like since 1979, and and it's still still going. She passed away from cancer recently, and uh, so I they don't want to they don't want to die just because you know she passed away. So right. that's something good because that that's the plays that you guys are talking about um, are the things that need to be seen. So I, I'm just trying to pump that up. Okay. What are you up to, though, Ron? And thank you for pumping up. Well, like I said, I like I I say, Court Theater has been very active. Uh, we we have <laughs> right. Actually, I'm missing a one of our uh, performances tonight. Uh, we have a series called Theater and Thought, where we right now we're working, we're uh, discussing and doing a reading of Le Blanc, 
by Lorraine oh. Hansberry. Yep. And uh, we did a series on August. We did a series uh, uh, on uh, with Tom Stoppard. Um, and we also have uh, we just sin. Um, so we're, we're we're staying active that way. But with other, you know, we have this theater for one series going where. It's a small plays, 10 minute plays are done for one, one patron at a time, um, which was done in New York. Um, we have the series, the Spotlight series, which I'm working on now, which is where I learned about Pauline Hopkins and Alice Moore Dunbar Nelson. Um, and so those are readings of some of their work over, you know, on a very virtual. That one actually is a podcast. But we're, you know, we're, we're staying busy in that way. Plus, we, we have a full season of, of virtual plays that are that are coming about, and uh, and then again, uh, I'm doing uh, August Wilson. We're trying to do all ten of the plays, and I've done eight of them there. So we got two more to go. You're gonna and, do it online. Uh, You're gonna be doing the. No, we're not gonna do. We're gonna wait till we're back. To herd immunity is taking place before we can do uh, August Wilson because the state doesn't want a virtual versions of of the place. So, and, and I can understand that. So we're going to wait till we can, that's why we're not doing it till the spring of 2022. And, uh, but up until then we'll be doing virtual. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a busy, it's a busy time. And uh, I'm working on a, a play with uh, Felicia Fields. If anybody knows Felicia, yeah. Yeah, she, she was a Tony nominated actress from uh, the color purple, the original color purple. And we're working on a musical about the blues. And so, you know, trying to stay busy, you know. Trying, you sound like you're doing it. There's, There's a lot no trying on. on your side of the planet. It, it, it is a lot going on. But, busy in but, Chi Town. <laughs> yeah, but well, Vanessa, you... read that about Pauline Hopkins. I, I really, I think you'll be impressed with her. I will, and I'll I'll write you when I when I'm done. I I I wrote her name down. I also wrote down Alice Moore Dunbar Nelson. Right, and the and Pauline's book is of one blood. Yeah. And what about you, Fenazia? What are you doing? What What are you planning? What's going on? There's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a writer, so I'm just trying to stay afloat. Um, I am a play that I wrote in high school that I completely forgot about. Um, because I like basically, um, my senior year, a girl in my P class was shot, and I like didn't really know who to talk to about it. And I, I didn't know her personally, like she was just in my class, but I like went to high school with her. And I, I think what I struggled with was watching her friends and how they were expected as young black women to just like move on very quickly and just live their life. And the way people didn't really regard their feelings. Um, and so I wrote a play kind of like exploring my feelings about that, but it was really painful for me at the time. And uh, this was also when I had just seen For Color Girls for the first time. So I was on that tip. <laughs> uh, and so I like wrote the play, but um, I discovered it this year when I was going through my, my files and um, I, I've run out, of, I've run out of plays. So um, I submitted it to a couple places and now it's going to be a part of this really cool theater festival called the Obsidian Theater Festival. Um, and the Breaking and Entry, Breaking and Entering Theater Collective is, has done a reading of it and that should be virtual soon. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, I'm just now working with Thronestone Theater on a commission piece with two other really exciting writers. Catherine Yu is one of them. Um, I'm writing a pilot. Um, I'm trying to graduate. <laughs> um, He's a college so, student in case you guys didn't know that. <laughs> I'm trying to graduate. Uh, I'm like really trying. Like of, of all things, I'm trying to graduate. <laughs> I don't know who's going to write my thesis for me, but um, maybe it'll be me. I hope it'll definitely be good. It'd be very good if it were you. Yeah, it'd be great if it happened. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just trying to graduate and finish my thesis, which is an adaptation of an ethnography called Shapeshifters, which is set in um, a homeless shelter in Detroit. And it's about how black girls navigate housing insecurity, identity, um, and all the things, queerness, all the things while living in Detroit. Beautiful. So. Wow. I'm tired just listening to you. That's a lot. <laughs> like, do you sleep? I mean, where's the sleep factor here? But I'm loving it. 
I'm loving it. I mean, we're all busy. And I really appreciate the fact that you guys took time out to hang out with us and have this amazing conversation. I want you guys to throw out one word that comes to mind when you think about what I want from 2021. Boom. One word. One word. One word. Boom. Boom. I'll throw a word out. Joy. Mm. That's my word. That's what I want from 2021. Expression. Peace. I go back to my hippie days. Peace. <laughs> I'm stuck. I'm going to say hug. I want everyone to feel That's like they're one. getting a hug. That's a good one. Whoever you are. Great one. Been a crazy, crazy year. Not only the pandemic, but everything, all this other nonsense. I mean, it, it was like insane, you know? And I can't, you know, I can't even, uh, can't even think about it. You can't know? even wrap your brain around it. Can't even wrap like your brain you around it. Get out my brain. It, it really, it really does. So that that caused some, some even rifts in my, in my family, because you know, Magley, I told you about my brother, and uh, and uh, I don't even know what he since the whole thing with the Capitol building and stuff. I don't know where what his thoughts are, but he's a diehard dude. He with that dude, man. Oh, oh yeah. Mm. Well, hasn't spoken to me since 2015 because because I don't didn't like that guy. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. That's, that's a story in itself. That's a journey in itself. <laughs> anyway. It's a loose family. Yeah, it's it. crazy. It's, it doesn't make sense. Blood is thinking in uh, all that Politics. nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to get political because, you know, we're going into a new time, but it just, it, it was a rough year. It was a rough year. Yep, yeah, a rough four year. A lot of us. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for starting the year off with us, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really, really, really a lot of fun. And I want to thank you guys out there for joining us. We didn't get any questions. And, and I keep on looking to see if there are questions. So I'm guessing there were comments. But I want you to know that if you want to keep up with what Conchell Productions is doing, just go to our website, www.conchellproductions.com to look up the events and um, donate because your donations make everything possible. And follow what all these artists are doing. I mean, seriously, we had an amazing panel of people. And you process for yourself what equity, diversity, and inclusion means to you. That's my wish for you. And thank you. Have a great day. OK, thank you. Bye. Good to see you, Trey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It was really lovely meeting you, Rod. It's always good seeing you all, Trey. You oh too. my god, I can't believe everyone knew everybody in this thing. It's so cool. I was like, I'm inviting people to thinking it's gonna be a whole big introduction. And then and then and then Finesse's like, Trey, I love Trey! And then and then everybody shows up, hey, run. I was just like, oh, <laughs> I, I saw I saw Panaj just playing LA.